You've made it. It's Sense of Place. My name's Sarah Fox. I'm your host tonight. Um, and I am so glad you joined us because tonight we have the one and only Seth Tibbet, the founder of Tofurky, among many things. Um, and he is here to tell us, among many things, why he thinks Klickitat County, right here in the gorge, is partly to credit or largely to credit for helping him launch his business and turn a vegan holiday roast into a worldwide sensation. So we're going to hear more from Seth in a second. One more group that maybe you've noticed here on your screen, Mount Adams Institute, they are the new home sweet home of Sense of Place here in the Gorge. And they are a wonderful nonprofit that are doing so much more beyond just the sense of place lectures. So if you haven't had a chance to check out Mount Adams Institute, I hope that you will do it because they have an ethic of connecting people to place um, and understanding the benefits that come from that. And I think that they're really setting some great examples both here and in the rest of the country. And so this year when Seth's application to be a sense of place speaker came into my inbox, I was super pumped. I just had a feeling this was going to be someone who I was going to enjoy getting to know. Um, I also was a little bit hesitant because I knew that the Tofurky story was an interesting story, but I didn't know if it would actually connect to this place and our sense of place. And I will tell you that as soon as I read Seth's application, I had no doubt that in the case of Tofurky, place has everything to do with it. So without any more waiting. I hope you will put down your wine glass or your warm milk or your dinner and join me in welcoming Seth Tibbet to Sense of Place Season 11. Thanks, Seth. Hey, good to be here. Thanks, Sarah. Did I hear you say misfit entrepreneur? Please. Everybody getting ready for a nice 2020 Happy New Year? Yeah, I was. <laughs> But uh, we do have a few costumes still uh, available down at the Tofurky Up, although they've given me limited space. And uh, I'm thrilled to be here. OK, let's get going. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. I'm thrilled to be talking about uh, Tofurky. Let me find my little share let's see oh yeah share and i'm gonna get us set up in slideshow mode so uh we are talking about clickitat county today and uh, that's been my home since 1981 and i just love it it's one of the most beautiful rural counties in America, and we're going to talk more about that and what it has to do with tofurkey and plant-based foods. And the primary uh, things that happen in Klickitat County are logging, farming, and tempeh production at one time. And uh, we're going to see how those things all connect. You know, plant-based foods are having a bit of a moment right now. You might have gone up to the Dalles and munch down an impossible burger that's a complete vegan burger or you might have invested money in beyond meat which was the most successful ipo of 2019 on the stock market and those guys have a lot of thanks to give to actually clickitat county which really was one of the many springs that brought forth the plant-based foods movement into reality but it was a long road that 
I took to Klickitat County. So uh, as Harriet Tubman said, every dream begins with a dreamer. Here was my dream. Okay, full transparency. I was not raised by hippie vegans. I was raised in Maryland in the 1950s and on the Chesapeake Bay. Me and my brother had a little crab business where we made $60 one su summer selling crabs. And Thanksgiving you could see was turkey. Although I think my mom might have set this picture up because honestly, didn't like tofer, uh, turkey, excuse me, <laughs> that much. And uh, my mom would slip me peanut butter and jelly sandwiches under the table at Thanksgiving when we were at my Uncle Ned and Aunt Glenn's house. So um, that was, I was a, a meat eater though growing up. It was meat and potatoes at my house. That all changed in the 1970s um, and particularly in 1977 when I went and visited the farm in Tennessee. And the farm, as you could see, was a hippie commune. In fact, there was 1,200 hippies. It was the biggest commune in America in that era where there was communes galore. And they were all what was called pure vegetarians, which meant they ate no meat, they drank no milk from cows, they had no cheese. They were pure vegetarians, which today we would call vegans. And they wrote this cookbook that I had been reading and I had been making their famous soy grit burgers, which tasted bad and they digested worse, but I was surviving on those. And then I found out, I turned a page and I started reading about this product called tempeh. And the farm was doing great things with soy products. They were studying tofu, they were studying tempeh, soy milk, soy yogurt, soy ice cream, they were really the leaders. They weren't so good on the business end of things, but they were very uh, good hearted people and they were soy pioneers. I went back from the farm in Tennessee and with some of the magic spores that I had gotten from the farm because they were just starting to make tempeh and tempeh spores available. And tempeh, for those of you that don't know, are actually is a product from Indonesia where it has been made for centuries. It's like a very high protein product and everybody eats it all over Indonesia. And to make tempeh, you cook the soybeans and you split the soybeans and you put this culture on them and you have to incubate them and ferment them for 24 hours at 88 degrees Fahrenheit. And during that time, the beans get knit together into this solid cake that has a real mushroomy kind of smell and a real firm texture. Unlike tofu, tempeh has more of a meat-like texture and holds together when you cut it very thin. So I started I went back to Oregon and I started making tempeh in these little picnic coolers. Um, and I could make a couple of pounds for friends and family a day. And it was a big treat because it tasted great and it just made my body feel really good because tempeh is one of the most nutritional superfoods known and it has a very high digestibility rate. So, Tempe kept me going quite a bit and into the late 1970s when I was a naturalist. Um, in 1979, I moved out to this farm, this 160 acre farm that was being run as an outdoor school and a camp by my friends, Gary and Belinda Hanley. And they were trying to make it as an independent camp with no help from the government. And they had campers that would come in there from schools and they had a summer camp and we were poor and we were just trying to make it. I was living in a teepee in the summer and I was living in this barn in the winter and with my friend Jim Wells who also had a teepee and he's a Trout Lake resident now, some of you may know him. And we were roommates in the winter in this barn where I would make some tempeh and I would sell it 
to the retreat center, which would have groups come out. And that was my start uh, making tempeh in an old refrigerator with Christmas tree lights strung around it. In 1980, we had this massive event in the Northwest. Mount St. Helens blew up in May of 1980. And that was symbolic of my whole world blowing up because I had been a naturalist and now I just felt the need to change. I was 29 years old and when the mountain blew up, my friend Jim Wells had just moved into his little tiny cabin in Trout Lake and he started chasing into the mountain. Most people were running away from there, but he got in his car and he was trying to get closer to the action in the volcano. So he, I always remembered him as being a great friend and what he saw in Trout Lake um, really impressed me as this beautiful place. So Jim and I went up to Alaska and in the summer of 1980, I made $7,000, which was the most money I'd ever had in the bank. And I came back in the fall and I started the Turtle Island Soy Dairy Tempe Company. And that was in Forest Grove, Oregon, which is just west of Portland. And it was in the Hope Co-op where they had a little deli in the back and the co-op cafe was closed at four o'clock and I would come in at four and with my pots and pans and I'd start making tempeh. And this was my incubator that I used to make about a hundred pounds of tempeh every night. And I didn't see any tempeh around Portland at that time. So I thought, you know, tempeh is gonna be big. It's gonna be just like granola at some point. Um, I can't wait to be like a businessman and sell all this tempeh because I'll make a profit and we can start our own outdoor schools and camps with that money. So that was kind of my dream. The problem with that dream was I didn't know nothing about business. Like this guy over here was kind of my image of a businessman. You know, they wore a suit and a tie. In 1980, businesses were not the place for social change. They were more uh, of the establishment order. But to show you how little I know, knew about business, this is a job announcement that I wrote in 1980 where I was looking for a bookkeeper accountant and a tempe ombudsman, whatever that was. And the salary was gonna be $3 an hour when available. And here was my copy to entice people to come to work at Turtle Island. Turtle Island is in the process now of expanding to meet the country's present and future tempe needs. This is a very exciting, nerve wracking, fun process that allows great insights into the inner workings of this country's free enterprise system. We are now seeking a few qualified, criminally naive people to help us make the transition from hobby business to hyperspace. The demands of this job are extraordinary. One's commitment to a vision is challenged daily with a mountain of never ending time consuming details. Therefore, we are asking that only the hardy pie in the sky dreaming lunatics apply. For to be honest, folks, while we will surely get fed and clothed from our work here, there just ain't no money in it, no how for nobody. And so, you know, people would read this, they go, oh, hard work, insight into the free enterprise system and no money. Yeah, that sounds good. I'll take that. But nobody did apply. So that was where my head was at you know, as a business person, really, really struggling. So right after I put in, in December 1st, 1980, I sent to the state of Oregon, my application to be a sole time op, small time operator, um, tempe business, Turtle Island Soy Dairy. I went to Minnesota to visit my uncle and George, and his beautiful wife, Rosie, who was this fiery redhead who had no problem telling people 
exactly what she felt. So I sat down with her after dinner one night, um, eating some of her amazing apple pie and told her all about my exciting plans to make tempeh. And this is what she told me. She said, this is a really bad idea, Seth. America is a meat eating country and always will be. No one wants to eat soybeans, especially moldy ones. So I was like, oh, thanks Rosie, but I'm gonna still stick to it and see what happens. The same response though came from the teacher lounge at the Forest Grove Elementary School where I was substitute teaching. And I told them that I was gonna do that and they had the same idea. They said, this guy is crazy. At least he can come back to teaching when he fails. So right when you know your dream is at your most tender spot and you're trying to talk yourself into it, you often get people that are telling you the other thing and that's what happened in my case. Oh, look, it's Jeopardy time. First Jeopardy question. And we're gonna send three free product coupons to the winner of this question. So get your Q&A or A and Q buttons ready. In 1980, this was also, you know, the year that Whole Foods Market started. And here's their first store, which was in Austin, Texas. So for three free Tofurky coupons, what was the original name of Whole Foods Market? Make sure your answers are in the form of a question. Ooh, I see some that are pretty close, but they're okay. not quite it. Oh, Crystal Kramer, you're really close. Yeah, where's your music, Seth? Got it, can oh, you hear it? closer. <laughs> I like your, I like your um, answer, Reggie Adams. What's Bread and Circus? Boy. Heidi, you're close. There, hold on. I think we, we have it? one at 728. Okay. Oh, good. Um, do you want it? me to say who, who, what it is? No, I'm going to say right here. Safer way. There we go. Good job. Right. I'll go so, check the timestamp at the end, Seth, but I think Mishan Havalosa got it. And I'm out. Congratulations, Mishan. And uh, we'll get this out to you. Um, Sarah's going to contact you for your address. Um, so yeah, safer way, like a lawyer's dream, like what could go wrong with a name like that? But that's what Whole Foods looked like, nothing like it does today. And in my world, this was what a typical co-op that I was sending my first tempeh batches to in the Portland area. You know, you can see that it was basically just a lot of fruit and veggies out of boxes. There were garbage cans full of brown rice. And this is how tofu came into the co-op at Hope Co-op in Forest Grove. They would get it in these big white buckets with cubes of tofu swimming around. And since there was no packaged tofu in 1980, they'd get these Chinese restaurant takeaway cartons and the volunteers would put on these plastic gloves and they'd reach in the bucket and they'd pick up the tofu and they'd put it in the uh, restaurant bucket and they'd write with magic marker tofu on the side. So that was tofu packaging in the 1980s, just to give you an idea of what these stores looked like. So I had the tempeh being made, but now I needed a way to get this product to market. So the first thing I did was I went to the junkyard and found this beautiful 1975 Datsun that had been uh, in an accident. It had been T-boned by something fast and large and one side was totally crashed in and a door, the driver's side door was missing, but it was 300 bucks and the engine was good. So this beat up old Datsun <clears throat> was the uh, delivery vehicle of choice where I would drive my Tempe once a week into Portland. 
The accounts that I go to, some of you Portlanders might know this. This is King Harvest. It's still around in a store today, but it was a tiny little store back then. And People's Food Co-op in Southeast Portland, also still around. But the big account was Corno's Food Market overrun uh, Southeast MLK. And uh, that is unfortunately not there, but it was a trailblazing supermarket. Like you couldn't find tempeh, tofu, or anything in the supermarkets at that um, point in time. But Corno's was first on the market and you could always go to Corno's and get that as well as like bulk handles that were misshapen and stuff. So really cool place. And then opportunity knocked. So I was making a hundred pounds uh, a day in a good week. So I could make maybe two or 300 pounds. And I got a call on April Fool's Day in 1981 from a distributor that was like, hey, we want your tempeh and we're gonna take it down to California and up to Washington and Seattle. And we're gonna need a thousand pounds a week. So I was like, oh, thousand pounds a week. I can only make maybe 200 pounds a week. So I need a bigger place. So my friend Belinda had already been trained in making tempeh. So she was making tempeh and helping me and I would make tempeh at night, but I would also go out and I'd search for a place to live, um, make tempeh that I could make this thousand pounds. And I figured, you know, I'm making about a thousand pounds a month gross. So maybe I have $400 a month top to buy, uh, to rent some place that I can fix up. So I started driving all around Portland and that area. And this was what $400 would buy me. The first thing I was looking for, I looked at old dairies that had nice floor drains and concrete walls, but the graffiti was beautiful, but the places were a mess and it was gonna take a gazillion dollars that I didn't have to fix them up. So after looking at several of those, I said, no thanks. I then went in to this place that was a underground basement warehouse production area and it had no um, windows and the problem of it was that there was a speedometer shop on top of it and every time they calibrated the speedometers and had to run the wheels real fast dead spider parts and dust fell down from the ceiling not only that the only way you get product out of the little basement was this freight elevators like you see people running into in the movies and there was even a ventilation staff like the wind that blew up uh marilyn monroe's dress in the seven year itch so i was like boy this is just not going to work and then i i had a, a brainstorm i said you know portland isn't maybe the place but in indonesia from my reading in Indonesia, this place, Malang, Indonesia in East Java is the place where all the great tempeh comes from. This is the best tempeh in Indonesia. And it's not in a city, it's made in the mountains where there's clean air and water. And then they put it in their little micro bus and they take it into Surabaya down about an hour drive away and they distribute it to the stores. So I was like, uh, you know, where is the Malang of Indonesia in around Portland? And I came up with, I remembered Jim Wells and I remembered Klickitat County. Boom. This is tempeh made in banana leaves, which is what they still do in Indonesia instead of plastic bags, by the way. Great tempeh. So, Let's start out for people that don't know um, Klickitat County, and even if you do, Klickitat County is a county that's right on the south central part of the state. It's about a four hour drive from Seattle, and it's the size of Rhode Island in area, and it has 25,000 people that live here and only one stoplight in the whole county. So it's a very rural county. 
I had started making tempeh over here in Forest Grove, Oregon, and drove it 26 miles into Portland, Oregon. And if you went up the Columbia Gorge here and past Multnomah Falls and all these beautiful waterfalls right along Interstate 84, you come to the town of Hood River. Going across the bridge, the rickety old toll bridge across the Columbia River, you get to White Salmon and then you come up 10 miles further north and you get to Hewsom. Another 15 miles, you get to Trout Lake. The area is surrounded by three mountains, the famous Mount St. Helens, which is about 20 miles as the Tofurky flies from Hewsom. You've got Mount Hood, which overlooks Hood River, 11,000 foot mountain. And then you have Mount Adams right on the uh, edge of Trout Lake. And this is home to us out here. The star of the show in Klickitat County is 12,000 foot Mount Adams, which is this beautiful mountain. And the glaciers come down and they melt into the rivers that feed the White Salmon River and the Klickitat and the lush Trout Lake Valley. It's a beautiful, beautiful mountain. The rivers all cut down through these frothy gorges that are lined with basalt rock. And the river is very interesting because it sort of divides wet western Oregon from the dry eastern part of the state. And one side of the river has fir trees and no rattlesnakes. The other side has rattlesnakes and firs and scrub oak uh, pines, excuse me, ponderosa pines. There's also spectacular meadows and flowers. Klickitat County is one of the most beautiful counties in the United States. And when you wind down the White Salmon River, about 20 miles south of Mount Adams, you get to the little town of Hewson, which is 17 houses, a church, and a school, and right now, the home of whitewater rafting. But in October of 1981, I stopped on this little bridge here, and for what I thought was the last time, because I had looked high and low in Trout Lake and all over Klickitat County, and I hadn't found my Malang Tempe shop yet. So I was kind of despondent, and I really felt like this was it. My little dream was not going to make it, and I just wasn't going to find that shop that I could afford. But then I remembered that somebody had told me about the school in Hewsome and they didn't know if anybody was in there. So I walked across the bridge and there before me was the old Hewsome school, which was in the shape of an L. And I got out of my car and I looked on the front door right there and there was this little sign that said for sale. And judging from the duct tape that was holding it up and the grime and the dirt, I could see that it had been sale for sale for a while. They'd had four classrooms out here on this shape of the L and then the other shape of the L. It had a full scale gymnasium and there was one other thing that when I scraped the grime away from the window, I looked in on the side and voila, there was the perfect commercial kitchen tempe shop that I needed. It had drains in the floors, it had tiles, it had a hood, it had stainless steel sinks, it had tables, it was perfect. So I didn't know if anybody was in there and I couldn't see signs of it. And not having a cell phone, I couldn't call the number on the for sale sign and I couldn't look up uh, not having internet, a Zillow listing. So I walked across the river to do an analog search at the Don and Betty's Cafe. And I walked in there and there was this old guy reading a month old copy of the Enterprise newspaper. And he was drinking coffee. And I said to him, say, 
Do you know if anybody's renting that school across the creek there? And he didn't even look up and he said, well, many have tried. And I said, uh, and? And he said, and tits up. They went tips up real quick. And then he looked up from his coffee and he looked at me to decide how long it was gonna take for me to go tits up. And judging from his frown, it was probably months rather than years. But I took that to be still, I couldn't, I drove home and I couldn't get that vision of that beautiful kitchen out of my head. So here's where the generosity of Klickitat County begins to show. It says, you know, there's an old Chinese proverb that a good neighbor is a priceless treasure. And the first inkling I got, I called the next Monday, Rick Melching, who was the superintendent of the White Salmon Schools. And he has just started his job. He had come to Klickitat County from Southern California where he had actually been inside a natural food store. Um, so it was one of the few people there that had been in a natural food store. And he said, well, we're trying to sell it for $50,000, which might've been 50 million to me. Um, but, you know, if you wanna rent it, it might be good to have somebody in there. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put you on the docket for the school board meeting in November, 1981, and you can come up and make your case for yourself, but I don't know if they'll do it or not. So in November of 1981, I walked into what is now the municipal building in White Salmon, and this little door on the side is where the school board would meet. And I had brought with me some tempeh salad and a tempeh appetizer of fried tempeh strips and a little ketchup for them to dip in. Now these school board members, there was five school board members and they were local orchardists and business people. And the, nobody in Portland knew what tempeh was at that point. And so here I was with my whole future on the line trying to convince these guys to rent their school to a moldy soybean farmer. And I made my pitch and I passed out the samples of tempeh and I tried to read the room and it looked like, you know, it was gonna be pretty dicey. But the head of the school board finally said, well, if we were gonna rent this building to you, how much could you afford to pay? And that was the question that I dreaded the most. And I knew I was poor and I knew this was negotiation. And so I said, um, well, how about like, I don't know, $150 a month and the room went quiet and you could hear like rustling of papers and like heavily constructed hindquarters grinding their chairs in nervousness. And I just felt like here's my whole future on this precipice right now. And I don't know which way it's going to go. And Finally, I heard the best words that I've ever heard probably in my life. This woman, amazing Margaret Walker, was on the school board and she was actually enjoying the tempe and she was just this wonderful community advocate. And she goes, for crying out loud, I say we take it. What have we got to lose? So with that, it carried the day and I became the new tenant of the Hewsome School, thanks to the generosity of Margaret, Rick, and the White Salmon School Board. So here was my team at that point. This was Alex Lyon, you could tell. He was a past member of the farm. He was a microbiologist PhD that actually was the guy at the farm that started their first Tempe starter lab. And I like to call him the George Washington of Tempe in uh, you know, the vernacular of the day. And this was Belinda Hanley, who really was just like uh, a good friend and had actually had one of her 
children at the farm where they had this deal where you could come to the farm and the farm midwives would deliver your baby for free because they didn't believe that you really should uh, pay for coming in or going out of the world. And then there was me. And the 150 was a good deal, but it also, the school came with problems. Like all of the water was frozen up and I had to redo that and Tucker, the plumber, came down and spent hours and hours getting the water back up and running. And after it got up and running, I went next door to Luther Olson's house. And Luther was in his 80s at that point. And he had this little house up on the hill that housed the town water. And he had a little well that he sold to the 17 houses and the church and the school. And I said, Luther, I'm going to be making tempeh at the school and soy products and using a lot of water. How much is it going to cost me? And Luther said, $10 a month. And I was like, Luther, I'm going to be using lots of water. I don't think you heard me right. $10 a month. And he wouldn't budge. And I'm sure that Luther, you know, as a retiree, he probably needed money, but he really was just a generous neighbor. And he kept the $10 a month vow for the whole time that he was in Houston. So the local white salmon paper was called the Enterprise. And in March, I moved into the school. I fixed it all up. The water was fixed. And they had the headlines, Tempe plant opens at Hewsome, which sent the whole Klickitat County scrambling to their dictionaries to find out what is Tempe. And it was a good headline, but you know that times are hard when a Tempe plant that's bringing in $1,000 a month is the lead story in the paper on the front page. And unfortunately, it had a picture right above it of the Mount Adams Seroptimus Club dinner. And the casual eye would think, oh, look at Tempe plant opens in Houston and there's the three happy Tempe makers. I'm gonna call them up for a job. So we got all these phone calls. I wanna work there and I wanna be your secretary and everything. And I was like, oh, the problem is we just barely have enough money for the three of us. But there weren't many jobs in that same paper uh, in March 18th in the editorial section, there was this job tips offered. And one of the lines that stuck out to me was, although there aren't very many jobs in the mid Columbia for either men or women, a proper presentation of yourself may make the difference in one job that is available. So that was the start. And I started renting out the school school for free for weddings. I just let people use it and everything. And we do basketball nights on Monday and never charge anything. But this was the Houston post office back then, the old post office. They got a better one now. But I want to read a brief section of my book about what happened in that building that showed the generosity of the people of Clickitat County. In the fall of 1982, I had another moment of good fortune. I'd walked over to the post office to send out some mail. Bonnie, the Houston postmaster and entire post office staff asked me if I might be interested in living in the one bedroom apartment that she and her husband, Dick, had created on the second floor of their house. Definitely, I said, their house was just across the bridge leading into town, a quick three minute walk from the Tempe shop. I assumed it had hot water available for its shower too, which I was missing quite a lot by then. I also hoped that their apartment smelled better than the mouse urine and mold that gave my travel trailer its distinctive aroma. Great, said Bonnie. The only problem though is I'm a man of limited financial means. That's not a problem. I'm not sure I could afford to pay the rent. Bonnie smiled. Seth, we can't find anyone who can afford anything right now. The economy's so bad. We just thought it'd be good to have someone living up there to keep things up until things got better. We'll let you stay there rent free. To this day, I don't know what was behind her and Dick's unexpected generosity. Perhaps she was grateful for the way we let the community use the school without charging rent. Maybe she felt a mother's concern for this wayward child. Whatever the reason, 
Bonnie's offer was beautiful and timely for this young bootstrapper. I came to the end of my first year in Hewson with a 13,000 square foot school with a commercial kitchen for 150 per month and had a clean, roomy, heated apartment for $0 per month. There's the idea out there that business is a mean dog-eat-dog -dog world. There may be some truth in that idea, but for me, the generosity I'd found in Hewson was deeply encouraging. It told me that business can also be a generous people helping people world. Standing there in the post office, smiling at Bonnie like a happy idiot, I had a strong sense that the universe was letting me know that I was in the right place, doing the work I was meant to do and doing it in the right way. That was Bonnie Smith. And I wanna point out that Bonnie and Dick were on the opposite ends of the political spectrum at that time. And that was one of the unique cool things about Hewson is when it, we disagreed on things, but when it came to helping people out, that was really, you know, it, it trumped everything else. So that was pretty cool. And what a stroke of luck that was that really helped me. After a year of living rent free, I, they, the economy was approving and they had a renter and they wanted to redo the place. So I needed another place to live. Here was another generous person, Amber Yezik, who agreed to rent me three trees on her land uh, for $8.33 a tree or $25 a month to build a tree house. And I had never built anything. But with the help of people like Bill McKinney and Stuart Snyder and others, we built this house in short order. It was 11 feet by 16. It was kind of like one of the first tiny houses. It had a kitchen of sorts, a sink with cold running water. It had a wood stove that would drive you out on the coldest nights. Had a nice little desk and a bookshelf, uh, a telephone with a party line. This phone was attached to the wall, as you can see. What a concept, huh? And uh, if you picked it up and somebody was talking, you did your call later. And it was a beautiful piece of land that allowed us, me and my friends, to build a nice little Frisbee golf course that we'd go out and play every day after work. So I wasn't making a lot of money, but at the same time, I was living right on a golf course and I had my own gym. So life was good. These were good years in Houston. Interesting visitors. When a group moves into a rural place, it's like a heart transplant. If the heart has good relations with the neighboring cells, the transplant will be successful. But if you disturb the neighboring cells, the body will reject the transplant. And this was Stephen Gaskin's quote <clears throat> from the spiritual leader of the farm. And, they were really good to their neighbors and they had great relations. And by golly, the farm is still there in Summertown, Tennessee, uh, celebrating its 50th anniversary. So interesting visitors, one day at the Tempe shop, these three guys came in and I was like, hmm, interesting guys. They all wear red, I wonder what that's about. And as you would suspect, this was 1983, and they were from Rajneeshpuram, which was a hundred miles drive to the east. And they had just shown up here because they were having in July of that year, which was a couple of months out, a big guru festival out there on their land in uh, right outside of Antelope, Oregon. And they were gonna have 10,000 people come to this guru festival. And they said, we need some tempeh. We need 2000 pounds of tempeh. And I was like, whoa, 2000 pounds. That's like a month's worth of tempeh to me. But I said, sure, we can do that. And so we started in making this five grain tempeh for the Rajneeshis and got it. And more than anything, I just was curious about, like everybody in the Northwest, we all wanted to go in and see what was going on at Rajneeshpuram. So I delivered it myself. And on the day of the July Guru Festival where they cooked it, I went over to inspect it. And here I am in my Mickey Mouse hat, looking at the beautiful tempeh. 
that was all chopped up. And they had built this kitchen. This was a temporary kitchen that had 12 semi trucks backed up to it and 25 woks that were cooking this sweet and uh, sour stir fry of tempeh. And it was amazing to see, you know, a couple months later, I'd go back to visit them and deliver some more tempeh and this whole kitchen was gone. They set this up. These guys had money. Um, and when you went over there, they had all of these just brand new tents set up for these 10,000 people to stay in. And that was in the middle of the desert. They had also, the the big muddy ranch that they had bought was an old cattle ranch and it had been overgrazed and the land was in disrepair. So they built this reservoir, which they used for swimming, but also to irrigate their garden and they were planting trees. Environmentally, they were doing some great things. You probably may have seen, if you haven't seen Wild Wild Country, which is a Netflix movie about the Rajneesh, it's an amazing story. Um, here we got to see the Bhagwan drive through in his Rolls Royce, which he did every day and would take him for a drive. And everybody in the commune would line up and bow and just get all excited when the Rolls Royce went by. So that was uh, a high point for these guys. But I still think that that 10,000 person tempeh meal was probably one of the biggest meals of tempeh ever um, fed and prepared in this country. Oh, look, Jeopardy time for a Tofurky feast. Here we go. Are we ready? Get your keyboards out for your A and Q. They were Here's... so fast last time. <laughs> I know, I couldn't believe it. I thought I was gonna have to give hints. Okay. But, uh, Here's, an, here's one for a Tofurky feast, and we'll see who gets this. Number of Rolls Royces owned by Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh in 1984. Please make sure that it's in the form of a question. Oh. Go. Okay, guys. I see a lot of numbers, but no questions. This is Jeopardy style. Let's see. Oh, getting close. Oh my goodness, you guys are fast. Yeah, put it. Uh, Diana Sintis, go to the Q&A instead of chat if you're wanting to put in an, uh, an answer or a question. Boy, Seth, I see some that are really close. There's so many. Um, we need the number. <laughs> <laughs> 1,102, not, oh, I think we, I know we have at least one correct answer. So tentatively, because I need to confirm, I think Lucas King is our first correct answer. And he said, what is 93? 93 exactly. Rolls Royces. This guy had 93 Rolls Royces. And here's a bunch of them lined up out there at Rajneeshpuram. And you can see they were all different colors. The guy had a sweet tooth for Rolls Royces. And you got to wonder, what in the world does a person need 93 Rolls Royces for? And what in the world could you do for the betterment of the world with the money that it costs to make these 90, to buy these 93 Rolls Royces? But congratulations, Lucas King, Trout Lake guy. So after the big, Tempe fe feast out of Rajneeshpuram. I went back to the school and I was still having trouble making a profit. I wasn't profitable. And so I thought, well, what can we do with these classrooms? So this one classroom was my office and I would sit there on Fridays, which was order days. There was no fax, no answer machine. So I just sit there at my desk patiently waiting for one of my four distributors to call and I would write down their orders. I would you know, be real casual when the phone rang and would let it go two times and then pick it up. But um, that was, my office was in one classroom. The school became like a small business incubator for Husamites. In one classroom, my friend Jim Wells had started Sycamore Associates, which was a museum design business. And he was there for about a year. And after that, 
Trout Lake Herb Farm rented the classroom out and they grew echinacea and they still do right in this field up in Trout Lake, right by Mount Adams. And they were making the first uh, echinacea tincture that I ever saw right there in the school. So that was a really cool use for the building. And then the other classroom was the Barton Box Company. And these boxes, this was an old retired couple and Bart was an amazing craftsman and he built these beautiful boxes. These, this photo was taken last week and you can, these are like, in, they're 35, 40 years old and they're in perfect shape and they're more like furniture than they were just like a fruit box but they were making these boxes. But I had one more classroom that I really wanted to rent out and I couldn't find anybody to take it until one day I was sitting at my desk and I looked out front and here comes this purple van with a yellow umbrella on top. And on the side is printed Ace in Space and Piano Tuning and Clowns, which you don't see too often. Uh, piano tuning and clowns in the same breath, but here it was. And these two guys get out and they come into the school and they introduce themselves as Ace and Space. And they're saying they're looking for a place to build their clown props. And there's an unwritten rule among landlords, don't rent to clowns. But when Ace pulled out a hundred dollar bill and rented the classroom, I was sold. And as soon as I had uh, taken their money, out popped like five kids from the van and three adults. It was like the proverbial clown car. And they moved into the uh, building and they started making these big wheels that the kids would roll down and all these crazy clown props, which gave the whole Tempe shop this Fellini aspect. So good old Ace in Space. Uh, they didn't stay too long and they didn't, they weren't great payers, but they made us laugh. So that was cool. You know, at that time, though, you'd think with all of this good fortune and free housing and cheap housing and cheap rent from the school that I'd be making money. But after nine years, I started looking at the reality of what I had built. I was still only grossing. The company was grossing $120,000 after nine years. That's like not much. And uh, this was my income right then. I had taken in over those nine years, $31,000, and which is, comes to a little less than uh, $300 a month. So I was starting to get depressed and I felt like, you know what, maybe Aunt Rosie was right that this isn't going to pan out. So I was pretty down, and but on the good side, I fell in love with a Trout Lake woman, Sue Spowart, and we had a little baby. Uh, this is our son, Luke, who is now 28. And um, they ask Sue, people right now, they ask her a lot. They go, uh, Sue, did he make you sign like a prenup? And she scoffs and she goes, prenup, prenup. I had a house. I had a job with insurance. He lived in a tree. He was making tempeh. He, I was the one that needed the prenup, and it was true. Um, so good news, she didn't marry me for my money. Bad news, didn't have any money. So I went to work. I was like, how can I bring more money in for this family? It's not just me and a tree now. I need to get money. So my big idea was I'm going to stop making tempeh, and I'm going to do this book on tree houses. So I started going all around the United States filming these tree houses because this was my pivot. I knew I needed to do something different. This was a tree house in Florida on the right that is, uh, it cost $100,000. It had Belgian beveled glass and hardwood floors. This other one was from Olympia, Washington. And I went to it two or three times with my photographer and we were astounded every time we went, like here's a new stereo, here's a new refrigerator, here's a new stainless steel stove. We were like, whoa, where's he getting his money? Turned out he was a bank robber and he would go out in Seattle and rob, he robbed 40 banks in Seattle before a bank. And then he'd come back up to the treehouse and live. But one of the um, bank robberies went wrong 
and he actually got shot and killed uh, robbing this bank in Seattle. So there's all these colorful stories. But like everything else uh, that I had done, I failed at the Treehouse book. I sent it to a publisher. I thought it was a sure win that they were going to go for it, but never happened. So I had to go back to the Tempe Mines. And at that time, I had worn out kind of my welcome at the, uh, I'd outgrown the Houston school. People were calling me up and saying, say, could you like maybe not wash your pots and pans right now because I want to take a shower and you're hogging too much of the water pressure. So I went over to Hood River right on the interstate and there was an old tortilla chip factory there that I converted into a tempeh shop. And so Turtle Island Foods moved right over there, still weren't making any money, 15 years into it. And the guy, the tax guy was always asking me, uh, I got two questions, how much money do you lose this year? And how are you still in business? But uh, I said, well, I lost lots of money and I don't know how I'm in business. I'm breaking kind of even, but I'm not profitable. So I had been messing around with tofu and a friend of mine, Hans Robel, who is an amazing chef and he has a higher taste deli company still in Portland, uh, had been making these stuffed tofu roasts which were he was selling to like 30 or 50 people of his five prime customers in Portland. And I bought one and I was amazed, like everything Hans does, it was just magic. So I convinced Tom uh, Hans that we need to go into business. Let's make a product called Tofurky because I have this, I'll make tempeh drumsticks and you make the roast and the gravy. We'll buy them and we'll market them because we have distribution all over the Northwest. So we made 818 Tofurky roasts and they had eight tempeh drumsticks. They had three pound loaf of stuffed tofu and they had a little thing of gravy and it was just uh, a success you know in each tofurkey box we put in these little cards because hey it was 1995 and there weren't computers and email so much people still just sent postcards or called the company and so people loved it and we knew we were onto something first, but nobody wanted to call it Tofurky. They said, that's just dumb. But I had been trying to live my business life in the image of that straight businessman for too long. And I was just like, well, if I'm going out, I'm going to go out in style and just be fun. So that's what we did with Tofurky. Then next year we changed the package a lot. And we still didn't have distribution outside the Northwest. So I went to my friend, Dave Wampler, who's a famous Trout Lake resident, and he was my neighbor. And I said, Dave, do you think you can sell these online or uh, by FedEx and we can ship these all over the country? And he was like, he's a can-do kind of guy. And he said, yes. And there was about 35% of America in 1996 that had computers, but he had found the one company that would take credit cards uh, online. And he had also was selling books online at that point. And he had gone to the largest book supplier that summer and pitched that he wanted to sell these books, be a bookstore online. And they just weren't hearing it. They were like, bookstore online, are you crazy? On the internet, nobody's going to buy a book that they haven't picked up and looked at it like they do in bookshops. But then they said, but you know what? Two weeks ago, there was a guy that came in here and he had the same idea. He was from the jungle or something, Amazonia or something. He had the same idea. So we just, to hedge our bets, we cut a deal with him. And that was Jeff Bezos. So he just missed out by a couple of weeks on being Jeff Bezos, but he's a great guy. And he sold about 400 of these Tofurky feasts online. The first food, by the way, that was sold online was a pepperoni pizza in 1994. Uh, and that was by, I think it was Pizza Hut. And it was just like a test. But Tofurky was one of the first products that was ever sold online. And it really helped by having 
Dave sell those for us. Okay, when we hit Tofurkis, you know, the first reaction, you know, Gandhi says, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Well, we had been ignored for a long time, and now we were providing laughter for people. The same week in 1995 that Tofurky came out, The New Yorker ran this funny little ha-ha comic about a roast non-turkey made out of rock-hard tofu, and it had firm tofu stuffing chunks, mock cranberry sauce, and it was all like nobody believed that there was a tofu turkey um, or that there's anybody crazy enough to do it. And but we were like really the comics loved us, you know, like all of the comedians and all of the newspaper comments were like, oh, this is so cool. Look at this. It's such an easy laugh. Tofurkey, Tofurkey. And, you know, even Opus got in the count there. So there's collections of these comics um, online. Even look at this. This was an ad from Citibank. Uh, that like was in Newsweek and they were like, it was my first Tofurky and I wanted to be just right. It was ha ha. So we were providing uh, a lot of cultural laughter into the world at that point. Like, and we didn't have a big marketing budget. We didn't have PR. So this was just happening kind of organically on its own. You know, they say your brand needs to either be remarkable or it's invisible and this was remarkable people were making remarks about it so it was a cool thing being into the thanksgiving business but when we as skeptical as the comedians were and others in the professionals when it got to the customers people were loving it they were going all over the world with their tofurkey box they'd fly these tofurkey boxes with them and they'd go under the sea they'd jump out of airplanes they'd go to the coliseum the taj mahal and i have a short little video now that i want to play for you that is going to show you some of the early placements and the early vintage TV spots that we never paid for. And we have uh, an old tape that we're gonna run right now. Erica, take it away. The pilgrims who landed at Plymouth Rock in 1620 were pleased to recognize the turkey. True to tradition, there was some confusion over the bird's name, but this time it was unaccountably slight. The settler's turkey was the Indian's furkey. Get ready, pilgrims. There's a new entree getting gobbled up this Thanksgiving. It's tofu turkey. So I'd like to introduce you to tofurkey. Okay. This is what you eat when you don't eat meat. Tofurkey! In fact, I'd love for you to try tofurkey jerky. We're talking tofurkey. Like tofu, like really tofu, tofu? Tofu, for those people that want a vegetarian Thanksgiving. Tofurkey. And people don't believe me, there is a tofurkey. Tofu turkeys with stuffing called tofurkey. You're going to need 50% more cooking time today, unless, of course, you have the world-famous... Oh, nice. The world-famous <laughs> tofurkey right here. First of all, who doesn't like saying the word tofurkey? Well, I'll well, say it one time. Hey, tofurkey. Tofurkey. It's a, it's a, check out how a faux turkey called tofurkey gets cooked up. We're ready to take out the tofurkey out of the oven. You got it in the oven. It's ready to go. It smells good. It smells good. It smells like real food. And uh, put a little bit of the uh, side around it. A little garnish. And I've got a couple of uh, meat eaters that are ready to, to try this out. Jordan, come here. Come on. Come here, Jordan. The Jack Russell Terrier, also my husband. He's also very well trained. Jordan, come here, buddy. Did you know? Uh, you like it, bud? Oh, you yeah. Want there it is. Oh, give me more of that <laughs> turkey. Do you want some more? I was. Okay. okay. Mm, -hmm. mm, that's good. Mm, no way. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. It tastes like turkey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not bad. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 For flavor and. Seven or eight, uh, yeah. seven, For flavor and consistency, yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm. I convinced mom to cook a tofurkey this year. We're serving tofurkey. Looking forward to Thanksgiving. <laughs> to 
more clues up there. Which one now? 400, please. Brand name of the tofu Thanksgiving dish from entrepreneur Seth Tibbetts. <laughs> what is tofurkey? Jive turkey, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. That's good stuff, It's man. a transvestite turkey. <laughs> I, right, for one, I love the tofu. Tofuna, tofurkey, tobago. You know, they're a vegetarian, and they have the tofurkey. With more than 2 million vegetarians in the United States, tofurkey proved to be too tempting to resist. I quit eating meat like three months ago. You did. Tofurkey? We should get some tofurkey. I want some, too. Miss Leone sold us made of turkey. Tofurkey! I asked for tofurkey! I'm a vegetarian! Half the zombies are vegetarian! Oh, my God! Now be a man and go get the tofurkey! No, I had a friend of mine cooked everything. Okay, the yeah, big turkey and all that. Big turkey and tofurkey. Have you guys heard tofurkey. of the tofurkey? I have to confess, I have tofurkey at Thanksgiving. Does it look so. like an actual turkey? No, it doesn't. I mean, that would be odd. Yeah, but now tell us about some of the other tofurkey products that you guys have to sell. Well, we also make a lot of other soy-based products. We have a line of deli slices. Mm -hmm. um, this is basically for your sandwich after Thanksgiving. Is the cranberry stuffing, um, all soy-based. Then we have a Philly steak peppered slice or Italian deli and then oven roasted and we also have a line of tofurkey sausages uh, which are just fantastic and the sweet Italian is our number one right here kielbasa a little bit spicier and then also we have beer brats which actually has full sale ale in the beer recipe rice. it's beer brats it's beer brats it's beer brats it's rice. high protein and low fat you know what next year you can all go tofurkey yourselves what about a toast toast huh mm -hmm. yeah to uh Tofurkey. 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 Huh? Tofurkey. <laughs> All right. So that was uh, some of the greatest hits early on. You can see how deeply Tofurkey went into the culture. One of the coolest things that happened after one of those episodes was I was sitting at my desk and I was really tired and it was seven o'clock and I was ready to go home after a long day when the phone rang and I go, hello? And the voice on the other end goes, Seth. And I go, Rosie, is that you? And yes, she goes, Seth, Seth, I'm so happy for you. You were on Jeopardy. You were so cool. And she was very happy for me, you know, and it was sort of one of those moments when I just felt like, you know what, my bootstrapping days are over. I've really made it as a businessman. Now Rosie approves of me, and she was very kind uh, to say all that. So that was an exciting moment. The Tofurkey Company today is in Hood River, and this is our new manufacturing plant. It's a lead platinum standard plant with 400 solar panels on the roof. It has free electric car charging as a green roof with a bocce court and it overlooks the Columbia River. And it's an amazing place to work. And it's really the brainchild of Jamie Athos who is now running the company and he's my stepson. We make 55 Tofurkey products that are sold in 27,000 stores all over the world. They're all vegan and we're still family owned and independent, which is different than a lot of companies that have sold a lot of their equity. We have everything from pizza pockets to cheesecake and cheese, burgers. We've got deli slices, sausage, Rosars and Safeway locally carry a lot of these products. And we more than anything are proud to be a certified B Corporation, which means that somebody has certified us for treating our employees right. Everybody has 100% of their medical and dental paid for, and they have 401ks. We love our 200 and some employees. And this is a sausage line. And to give you some idea of the scope of the manufacturing that we're doing, is if you were to lay all of the sausages that we make in a year end to end, they would stretch from Hood River all the way to Portland, Maine and out into the Atlantic, uh, a couple of miles, over 3000 miles. So that's a lot of sausage being made um, by Tofurkey. The plant-based section now at the supermarket you'll go into, you'll see just about every supermarket has one of these. 
and it's amazing. You can get tempeh, you can get chicken, you get sausage, there's milk, there's soy yogurt, there's um, ice cream, cheese. It's an amazing time in plant-based foods right now. And, you know, it's amazing to look back to 1980 when this was what the plant-based section looked like. But things keep going on. Oh, we have another Jeopardy question and there's the answer. So let's go, come on people. This one, you're not gonna be able to Google, but the world <laughs> city has the highest number of vegan restaurants per capita. That isn't the most number of vegan restaurants that uh, a city has, but this is the world city that has the most, the highest number of vegan restaurants per capita. And this is for a copy of my book, In Search of the Wild Tofurkey. A lot of, lot of Portland's. That's yeah, not the answer Portland though. Portland is a good wrong answer. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a new deli. Okay, some India India thoughts. Nope, not Eugene. Not London. New Delhi has a lot of vegetarian restaurants, but there's only four vegan restaurants in that whole city of 15 uh, million people. Tel Aviv. Nope, not San Francisco, not Berlin. All right, getting Seth. close. I'm going to give it a, a hint. You know, you're close when you're saying Berlin. It's a European city. And it starts with a? P. <laughs> Not Mumbai. OK. A place that you would want. Oh, Sherry Jackson, 822. What is Prague? Nice job, yes. Sherry. Yes. Prague, the beautiful Prague, uh, beautiful city. And Portland is actually the second um, most per capita um, restaurant in the world. You can see the overall winner is London has 165. These are all vegan restaurants, um, but they have a very high population compared to Portland. So you can see why Portland and Prague are out there. But these are basically the top 12 cities in the world. Um, for veganism. It's just like a worldwide phenomenon right now. Plant-based foods are uh, just like a jet stream going off now. And uh, Prague's a good place to go if you're looking for vegetarian food. In the market that we sell in, which is the meat alternatives you see right now, it's just like hockey stick growth. All food in supermarkets sells at about 2% a year. If they get 2% growth in a standard supermarket with all their food, they're like celebrating. So when they see a category like they did in 2016 going up to 5%, they're like, this is a hot category. We got to get more of this in. But now it has just gone up to, in 2019, it was about 50%. The last sales data I bought the plant-based food category was up over 100%. And it's just an amazing thing that's going on right now. Um, it is still a small percent compared to animal-based meat. And the US per capita consumption of animal-based meats is still right around 200 pounds. And I just wanna point out that that's 200 pounds and I didn't eat any, which means somebody out there ate 400 pounds. Maybe that was Sarah, I don't know. But uh, it's, a, it's a jet stream right now that's happening. And he, what's really kind of interesting is the big guys are getting involved, including Tyson and Nestle and Heinz. You've got ConAgra. You've got the biggest companies on earth, Hormel, Cadbury has got a vegan product. You even can go down to any of the Burger Kings in the US and you can get a vegan impossible burger. So a lot of signs pointing right now to what's happening in the plant-based space. Tofurkey is just kicking along. We're doing fine. We're having a good year. 
last week we hit a milestone. We just sold our six millionth tofurkey roast, which is really pretty amazing when you think about where we came. Locally, these roasts are available at Rosars, Fred Meyers, uh, Harvest Market in White Salmon, and the book In Search of the Wild Tofurkey is available at Wacoma, Trout Lake Hardware Store, and Amazon, and wherever fine books are sold, or maybe on the shelf just below fine books, but it's a good read and it's a fun story. Um, this is Hood River, and this is our two plants that are right on the Columbia. This is Mount Hood, 11,000 foot Mount Hood that's right in the background. It's a beautiful place and it's an incredible thing to um, think back on and where we've come from. This is our family portrait. This is my son, Luke. This is my stepson, Jamie, who's doing the fabulous job, especially now in COVID of running the Tofurky plant. His wife, Rachel, Sue, my wife, and it's just amazing when I cross over the bridge though, and I come from Oregon and I hit Klickitat County and I hit that one stop light, I just feel this overwhelming sense of gratitude. And this big plant-based food sector that is happening now owes a lot to the people of Klickitat County who have been generous and have not they put aside kind of their differences to be kind to me. And I'm so appreciative of it. And I can tell you this one thing for sure, Tofurky would never be here without all of the generosity of the White Salmon School Board, of uh, Dick Smith and Bonnie Smith, Luther Olson, all these guys that helped propel the dream forward. And it's pretty unique in that sense. And I think that that putting aside the political differences to work together is still alive in Klickitat County. And to end my talk, I wanna give one example of how that happened just last month. I had this six foot by six foot garden shed that I needed to move. And I was figuring out how in the heck am I gonna move it? It's pretty heavy. And I called up my one neighbor to the north, who's a Democrat, and he said, I'll come by with a tractor and help and dump some gravel for you. And uh, I, that didn't do it. So I walked over to my neighbor, who I didn't know that well. And I know that he's kind of skews towards the more conservative side than I do. And I said, I got this shed to move. And he said, I'll be over there in five minutes. And so here we were, five minutes later, he shows up with this big old, forklift he picks up the shed and he just plops it right where we need to and we're all out there democrats and republicans were crawling under this shed and we're just getting everything going and you know it just showed me again that that underneath all of our differences there's this bond in clickitat county that really unites us and i'm just so grateful for that i'm thanking all these people, Rick Melching, Belinda Hanley, Luther Olson, Bonnie Dick Smith, Amber Yezik, Sue Tibbet, Barton Roma. Uh, I've got the Sycamore Associates, Old Ace in Space, Dave Wampler, Trout Lake Farms, the people of Clickitat County. And my wish for everybody at Thanksgiving is that you'll just get adopt the attitude that life's too short not to love everybody and it's far too long to hate, you know, which is a quote by Todd Snyder. And I want to wish everybody a happy Tofurky Day. Thank you very much. Well, okay, Sarah, I'm how here. How are we doing? I'm coming here. I'm here, Seth. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I have this again, like there's so many moving parts here. It's easier in person. Um, so first of all, I, I knew that you were going to have good stories, but I had no idea that we would go from um, the Rajneesh to Safer Way to Jeopardy. I think there was a Friends episode maybe. So um, thank you. And thanks for bringing it back to the role that Click Attack County and this local place has had in supporting you. 
We have a lot of questions and um, I know people have bedtime, so I'm going to get right to it. Somebody asked, um, let's see, are you having any problems with copyright infringement and others using the name Tofurky? That's a great question. And um, when you see Tofurky, a lot of times people put the E in it. Uh, like there's an E in Turkey, but there's no E in Tofurky. Why is there no uh, E in Tofurky? We put Tofurky without the E for two reasons. One was copyright because there were uh, people that were using the name Tofurky, just very small. Um, and, but there was nobody with Tofurky. But the main reason I did it was I wanted to get 800 T-O-F-U-R-K-Y. And I registered that with the phone company. So we had 1-800-T-O-F-U-R-K-Y, which was great. This was like 1997. And we were expecting all these calls. And then after Thanksgiving, I was like, I wonder why that phone didn't ring that much. Like the 800 number, nobody's using that. And then I was like, ooh, I wonder what happens if you call T-O-F-U-R-K-E. And I called up T-O-F-U-R-K-E and I got this hair salon down there in Los Angeles. And this woman's like irate and she's just reading me the riot act. And, you know, she wants to go on and on. I got all these damn tofurky calls about tofu turkey. And I was like, I could send you one. What do I want with a damn tofu turkey? You know, she just wanted to go on and on about it. So uh, I don't, you know, we have had a few cases where we've had to protect our mark and tell people, hey, you can't use the name for that. So we're protective of it, but it's so, uh, you know, well known now that we kind of don't have that a lot. Does it feel like a double-edged sword to see the shelves full of other plant-based products, but also to see um, bigger companies and maybe companies that haven't typically had the ethos of Tofurky coming in and trying to be part of that market? We actually like that. You know, when the um, category is hot, it's really a great time for us to sell our products as opposed to when the category is shrinking. So we want all of these plant-based companies to succeed. Um, it's just part of it is our mission that we want to see the world adopting this diet. And the other part is just the plain business reason of like, Hey, it's it's better when the category is hot because if they're selling, you go in there and they say, "Well, this other stuff's selling. Why wouldn't I take yours?" Sure, let's go. You know, you're doing 100% growth a year, and the rest of our food's 2%. So it's happening. Tell me about someone was asking um, about a lawsuit that that's being brought against the meat industry's efforts to limit the words like meat and sausage yeah. on plant-based foods. Can you tell us a little bit about what that's all about? Yeah, so 27, I think, states have laws that are pending or on the books, and they're saying that it's very confusing for consumers to look at something like that says veggie burger or tofurkey sausage, vegan sausage, and they think they're buying meat, but they're actually buying plants like um so we've got to regulate that, but it's really just protectionism from the meat industry that's doing that. And uh, Tofurky has sued Missouri and Arkansas and just recently Louisiana for their laws. And we are kicking butt in those states. We've had good results from the um, courts by and large. And they agree with us that it's not confusing and uh, that these laws are just frivolous so we but it's a fight first they ignore you then they laugh at you then they fight you so we're in the fight stage that's one stage from winning i want to point out <laughs> <laughs> um i'm looking through here we've got um let's see well this may be sort of personal so you can decide if you want to answer or not but it says when did you take on financing to grow the business did you already have impeccable data to lean on or was there a bank officer with faith that the loan would help you grow there was a bank officer with faith and his name was Bob Tibbet, my brother in the crab business way back then. And in the early days, you know, I was borrowing money from family and friends and, you know, paying it back, not always on time, but I paid it back. 
And then um, in 1990, I gave Bob like 27% of the company for like $17,000 investment. I was like that. And then my mom like gave me $5,000 of my inheritance, like pre, she says, I see you're working hard. I'm, you know, I'll give this to you now. And um, I was like, no, mom, I got to give you some. So I gave her like 13% for like $5,000. I told you I was a crummy businessman. <laughs> and then, uh, but since then, you know, yeah, then we've grown up and we mostly deal with banks or um, like a couple of years ago, we had to borrow um, with this big hockey stick growth to keep up. We had to borrow $7 million from a ethical vegan investor and um you know he had checked us every out uh, pretty hard and but we bought all this equipment with it and um he's happy now and we're happy we got all this equipment installed just before in january of this year right before covid hit and our numbers just like went through the roof because everybody's cooking at home now and uh the retail space has really been growing so we were lucky to have uh, a ethical vec investor that in believed in us. Um, when it's not COVID time, does the local plant here um, in Hood River offer tours? Someone's wondering. Yes, we've okay. given many tours. Um, you just have to call or uh, info at, you can write info at Tofurky. You don't have to call these days, you can do internet. <laughs> Call 1-800-TOFURG. No, yeah, what happens if, if you call it? We don't have that. It was actually 888-TOFURG, uh, I think. And uh, I believe we stopped that because now, you know, back then it was like a phone call could put you into pretty serious debt if it was long distance. So <laughs> it's like now, why would you have 800 numbers, right? Uh, um, but yeah, we do do tours. Okay. But occasionally you have to set it up. We don't have anything regular scheduled. Okay. Um, someone is curious about if you're currently running operations at both the old and new plants, is the old plant even still operational? Yes, they uh, both plants are operational. The old plant still in the upstairs has tempeh production and downstairs is tofurkey production. Um, and the new plant down on the waterfront is all Tofurky. And then we have the, the old Lure Jensen building, which is right on the water that we rented out for uh, along, we rent out most of that. We have three quarters of it and there's a couple other companies in there. Um, but we use that as our distribution center. So we have, it's like a three ring circus. You know, Hood River is not the place anybody sane would go. They'd, you know, be, hmm, where in the Northwest could we, should we put our, big food production factory. I know, Hood River. And it's just like, um, but we love Hood River. We wanted to be here. This is where we wanted to live. And so um, like Amy's kitchen paid more for, they paid l less for 50 acres of land than we paid for uh, one and a third acres of land that we can't expand anything out to <laughs> in Hood River. So we're, we're not the sharpest knives in the drawer. Well, that, 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 I'm not. <laughs> your business acumen has really stayed consistently through, huh? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I'm just trying to be less stupid. That's all I'm trying to be, Sarah. <laughs> Um, let's see. Someone is wondering about the distribution of tempeh lately because they're saying it's hard to find locally at Rosars. What's the deal? I don't know what's happening at Rosars. Rosars used to have like all of our products and I've talked to them a little bit um, <laughs> up there, but I haven't talked to the right person yet because it's not just tempeh. It's like their whole, uh, you know, case is just of, of meat alternatives. This, uh, it's a shadow of its former self. I don't know what's going on there. You know, I mean, stores go through these funny times, just like other businesses and somebody leaves and forgets to order this, but uh, this has been going on for a little bit. So um, it's actually Safeway now, you know, has a better sort of set than Rosar's, which is really sad because I do a lot of shopping at Rosar's. Yeah. Um Someone was wondering, especially with all the COVID going on and we're hearing about meatpacking plants, how are your employees doing? How's that going? What have you guys done to adapt to current conditions? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So Jamie, who has been running the day to day, he is a trained scientist. He's like a PhD neurobiologist from the University of Washington. And so he saw early on what COVID could possibly do. So as soon as uh, that happened in early March, he got on it and he started building partitions and taking out all but 10 chairs in the lunchroom so that only 10 people could go in there, staggering shifts. He had to do all that on the fly while our orders were like doubling. So he put all of these um, checks into place, you know, masks and temperature checks and, and cleaning and bringing more people on in case somebody got sick. So we've had uh, a couple of employees that have gotten COVID, none of them trace back to work situations, but um, they were thankfully mild cases. And, you know, we knock on wood, we haven't had anything in a while, but now with COVID going back up, we're still, we're on edge because, um, you know, we you can only, control about 40 hours a week of your employees and then what else they do in their spare time, you know, is up to them. But we've driven it home and most people have been pretty good about it. So um, we hope that everybody continues to stay healthy, but we did have a couple of cases, but Jamie's been, and the whole staff has been just incredible. Um, we have a question that have come, it's come in from a couple kids who I know will probably have to go to bed soon. So I'm going to ask it, even though it's a bit of change <laughs> yeah. of pace. Gus and Mick want to know what is the best way to sneak up on a tofurkey? And I know you uh, and I have some experience with this now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, great question, Gus and Nick. But um, I would refer you to our uh, video, which shows that the tofurkeys grow on trees, so they're not responsive. To, they're they're like on there. You don't have to sneak up. You can just walk up to them and pick them, but you got to get them when they're ripe. But um, there's no real stealth involved. They're not animals. They're plants. And as you know, plants don't creep around too much. They just kind of hang out there. <laughs> and that's the way tofurkeys are. They just hang in the trees. Am I right, Sarah? You're told, I, I didn't know. Um, for those of you who, who haven't seen it or are wondering what Seth is referencing, I um, took Seth to go hunting, as you do with a vegan, and we were going to go hunt for tofurkeys, and um, we made a short film of it um, where, in fact, Seth schooled me instead of me schooling him, and we were harvesting tofurkeys. So if you want to know what he's talking about, you can go to the Mount Adams website, um, and we have it there on the Sense of Place page where you will see the myth of the mother tree and you will see Seth harvesting perfectly ripe tofurkeys from the tree. So very special. Yeah. Um, I want to be aware of your time and, you know, other people's times, but we still have a lot of questions. Are you good to stick around a little I'm bit good. longer? I'm okay. on COVID time, you know, All right, I do have COVID to get time. up at five 30 tomorrow morning for a conference over in it, uh, the UK, but I'm good. Okay. Well then we'll just keep going. Um, let's see. <laughs> um, let's see. This is a question um, looking at climate change. How much do you think the concern over climate change and the impacts of eating animals is driving sales? Most people <clears throat> come to our products and products like ours for one of three reasons. One, what can they do for me and my health? Two, what can it do for the animals and Three is what can it do for the environment? And the environment is really uh, a growing concern for people. And, you know, if we don't stop eating meat or reduce our meat pretty drastically, it's going to be a very hard time making the climate change goals of keeping the planet cooler than 1.5 degrees Celsius from warming up. So, We've got to get people eating less meat or no meat in order to hit that number is what I because um, greenhouse gas emissions from animal agriculture is about 19 percent and of all emissions. And uh, to put that in perspective, I think it's um, about 12 percent comes from all forms of transportation, planes, trains, cars. So it's a big 
problem. And uh, but the overall reason why people stay or come to plant-based foods now is what we say is taste is king, values queen, everything else is marketing. So if the product tastes good, you know, and uh, that's what our mission is, is to make these e ecological plant-based foods in a way that's affordable and in a way that's sustainable because they just taste so dang good. Um, I am curious, uh, um, what's your favorite vegan city? London. How come? Oh man, they just, when I first went over there to sell Tofurky in 2014, the Londoners were like, oh, you're from America. Like you guys are so far ahead of us, but they have this program over there that they started called Veganuary in 2014, where for the whole month of January, and you can go to veganuary.com and do this. If you want to try eating vegan for a month, you can do anything for a month, right? And uh, you go to veganuary.com, you pledge, and uh, you eat, you just try out the diet, see how your body feels, see, are you losing weight? Are you feeling good? And they have been doing that now. They had 500,000 people almost sign up last year to do that. So it's totally changed the country and it's on everybody's lips. There's just all these great, you know, whatever you want, fried chicken, vegan fried chicken. There's like these Donner sandwiches, which are like this Turkish burrito with vegan lamb and tzatziki and cabbage. I mean, it's just a, a, a holiday. It's one big party. The stores are stocked with all these innovative products. They have sausage rolls, they, Pizza Hut, McDonald's. On in January, you go to any restaurant and they have like vegan options, like, and a lot of them stay on. So it's just heaven for vegans. Love it. Um, let's see. Do you, let's see. Someone's wondering. Will we all get gravy this year? Last year, no gravy was for sale in North Carolina, and we love the gravy. What's <laughs> up, Seth? You know, um, this is one thing that I noticed early on in the, uh, you know, there's distribution holes. Like, even if we are fulfilling 100% of the orders, sometimes they don't get out to stores. We've had a very high rate of fulfillment we're but we can only do so much we can't order for the store or for the distributor so uh but when we get phone calls or complaints from customers you know we can't throw them under the bus either so it's a kind of a dicey situation but uh i know that we have shipped a lot of uh tofurkey roast and gravy out to the great state of North Carolina. And, uh, you know, if you go onto our website, there's a store locator um, there that'll tell you what products are available and what stores. So I would send her to that and that should tell you where you can get that gravy. Um, okay, let's see. Does your company, is there anything that, that Tofurky is able to do or is doing or hopes to do to support the farmers growing the plants that are used for your products using regenerative agricultural growing methods, which I don't know what that is, maybe you do, um, but talk to us some about the relationship you may have with the folks actually growing the plants. Our biggest relationship that has gone on the longest time <clears throat> is that there's uh, a small farmer in Texas that grows all our soybeans for the tempeh and they're an organic farmer we buy from like all of our soy is um, organic from organic sources so we don't buy any from china or um, overseas it's either canada or the us in terms of um, like our organic so we we do use organic soy um, which is as close as we come to the regenerative agriculture but um, you know, and, and they do a, a really good job. We've been to that farm and they're, they're amazing the way they treat the soil and, the, um, organic matter. So, you know, that just takes the GMO question out of the, um, conversation when you have organic. So that's what we've always done is from the day one, we've always had organic soy as the 
basis for our food. Okay, I want to go push it even further. We've got someone who would like to buy your products, but they're also super aware of not having any more waste or trash than necessary. Is there anything down the road where you could actually get Tofurky deli meats or something from the deli section where you could bring your own container and not have the packaging? That's a, a really good question. And it's one we've spent a lot of time researching. The place that we're caught in <clears throat> is um, safety of the products is the number one thing that you have to be concerned about, of course. You don't want to make anybody sick. So there's these high barrier films that are not, you know, anything in the way of recyclable that we're kind of forced to use. The other thing that other than safety that we're really stuck with is that we have to sh um, ship these products all over the country. And we just haven't found uh, a way to have the shelf life um, that we can get and the safety that we need to make sure that there's nothing bad growing in there. And that is, you know, that ecological, but our biggest ecological footprint is just making tasty plant-based foods, um, which, you know, have a, an amazing ecological footprint, you know, just for instance, uh, like in water usage, it's like 2,500 gallons or something of water to create like a pound of steak. Whereas, you know, for tempeh, you give me a, a half of a pound of soybeans and I'll make you a pound of protein. So it's an amazing uh, different, you know, the amount of water, it's like 347 uh, gallons for a pound of tempeh and 2,500 for meat. So that's a huge thing. And we can't solve all the world's problems, but if we can find a packaging that is suitable to our safety standards and shelf life standards, we'll be the first ones in line to do it. But great question. Um, how do you reconcile this plant-based food, the vegan lifestyle with like, I know so I've heard people talk about um, food like meat alternatives as being highly processed. And so that sort of seems to fly in the face of, oh, vegan and food, you know, veggies and mm -hmm. stuff. So how do you, how do you reconcile those two things, highly processed food and plant-based? Yeah, you know, um, it's funny how what we think of as the word processed, it's a very sort of political way of describing things, you know, it's a process, um, raising an animal, killing an animal, cutting them all up and doing that, you know, and there's sort of this misnomer out there that be, the number of ingredients in a product somehow has something to do with the health of the product. Like if you just have one ingredient, it's healthy and, you know, 10 ingredients, it's not. Uh, and we have, you know, ingredients, we have 10 ingredients or more in so like Tofurky deli slices, but uh, they're good ingredients. You know, they're like garbanzo beans, they're white beans, there's like onions and garlic and, you know, th these soya and tofu. And, you know, we're more, our process is more like a bakery and like bread. Like, do you think of bread as processed? Um, you know, I mean, not really not good bread. sense. Yeah, this is, this is good bread. We're making good bread. Um, whereas, you know, I mean, bacon, for instance, that's like one ingredients, but it's a bad ingredient, you know, I mean, and it's carcinogenic and, um, you know, so the word process usually comes as a criti criticism from, uh, a carnivorous standpoint of, you know, like, why is all this plant-based foods taking my space? But uh, it's a fair question. So one to talk about as a critique. Like um, someone commented, as I'm sure maybe other people did um, at home, they said 100% medical and dental for your employees. That is absolutely amazing. Wow. And I would love to know if we were a room full of CEOs of companies, who were not B Corps or maybe who were not currently providing that sort of 
thing for our employees. How would you convince us that doing that actually made sense? Well, you know, it is the right thing to do and it makes you feel good, but there's also uh, a business, there's many business reasons for doing that, you know, and treating employees like it's very expensive to lose an employee and you know you have a key employee that um, is doing a job and to retrain and hire a new employee is terribly expensive um, so you really from a business standpoint that's you know one of the many reasons of why it is important to have like a uh, company and, and it also keeps people there you know people when that we spend so much time at work that you want to feel like what you do is appreciated and you want to feel like it's doing good in the world and that again it's not on you know it, it keeps people interested it also inspires them to be more efficient and more productive than if they're just bummed about their job and they're just waiting for five o'clock to come around. But, you know, if you can get people to buy into your mission and the something that's bigger than just the idea of making money or getting paid for money, you put in more than time, you get paid more than money. And that's, um, you know, so I think a mission-based business has a lot of uh, things that are sometimes hard to quantify, but, you know, it, it is very expensive to be just abusing people. And, you know, I mean, these workers too, you know, it's what I think is even better and what really resonates with people is just having 401ks. Everybody's got a 401k. And like, these are people, you know, like you look at some of these, um, I don't mean to bag on meat processors, but in, in just food processing in general, it's very rare that, you know, production workers will have, you know, the, it's just like, here's your minimum wage, the, you know, your disposable commodity. And uh, that's just not the way it is here. It's like, you know, and these people are blown away, like when they do move or something and they say, oh, you've got this big chunk of money. Like what? I had no idea, you know? So it's cool concept to be getting that, you know, money to people that, do the hardest work. It's hard work. I've done every job at Tofurky and it's hard making food eight hours a day, standing on concrete floors, you know, and with your hands doing all this repetitive motion. It's not easy work. So you really want to um, take care of people as to the fullest extent. And I couldn't do it for a long time. And I'm just thrilled that we're able to do it now, having grown to this point. Okay, it's almost nine. I want to let you go. I want to let um, people know that this has all been recorded and next week we'll put it online so you can watch Seth over and over again. Uh, um, I'm curious, Seth, uh, just as a parting note, what will you be having for Thanksgiving this year? I'm going to do tofurkey. I'm going to do mashed potatoes and gravy. And I got some cranberries. Um, you know, there'll be salad. It's just going to be probably me and Sue. So not going to be too exciting on the big family picture of things, so, which is great, though, because it'll be more tofurkey leftovers. I like tofurkey honestly, um, better the second day. I just heat it up to just like with the, you know, potatoes and gravy and Oh, I eat on it. You know, I'll take a, a roast and I'll eat on it for almost a week <laughs> if, if I can. If I can, there's usually not leftovers. So I'm looking forward to that. And, you know, we'll probably do a ham. We have a nice tofurkey ham now that's amazing. So probably do that for Christmas, but I'll smoke the tofurkey. I'm going to smoke it. I have a little smoker that I'll have there. So I go out there. It just there works the set. You just, you can just put it in and smoke it. You can do it any way you do meat. People have deep fried tofurkeys, you know? I mean, wow. like you deep fry turkey, like I've never done it. But uh, yeah, you can be creative. Lots of recipes at tofurkey.com. I like it. Good plug. And if you guys have come up with any cool recipes, let us know. Um, we will follow up with those that won the Jeopardy. Um, I should also announce that 
Seth had one more thing, which was a random giveaway. What a, a Tofurky feast. Yeah, that- right. R- random. And he said that it was going to be um, random and, and it was going to be number 42 on the registration list, which you guys don't see, but we do. And so, Christy Lagali, if you are still here, oh my you gosh, won Christy. that. Um, I know her. Yeah, oh, she's good. great. Perfect. She's a she's a entrepreneur. She's a she's one of us. Awesome, <laughs> great. So Christy will follow up, or Seth will follow up if you guys know each other. Um, but thank you so much. I'm so glad that we finally got to talk more, and I got to ask questions and hear more about your story. I loved going hunting with you. And yeah. I really appreciate you recognizing this place and how it's helped everything that you've done since first coming out here so many years yeah. ago. So the it's little, what we needed this time of year, I think. A little bit of thankfulness. Yeah. The little deer trail that Clickitat County helped establish has grown into a super highway right now. And, you know, uh, I think that the Beyond People and Impossible and all these startups now. They should all be tipping their cap to Clickitat County for all its goodness and that it's inspired in the world. So it's a great place to live, the mid-Columbia. Go Clickitat County. Thank you very much, Seth. Next month, I'm very excited. We're going to have a conversation with Gladys Rivera, who, if you don't already know her from all the work she does in our community, from public health to being a city councilwoman, um, Next month is going to be your chance to get to know her better. Um, And it's going to be a slightly different format for two reasons. One, it will be a conversation. Gladys is going to um, sit down with me and we're going to get to just chat about her life being born and raised and growing up here in the gorge, the changes she's seen and her unique perspective on this place. Um, And it's also going to be the first time we've ever been able to offer a lecture in both Spanish and English. So there'll be more information coming out about how that will work. Um, And we're going to try to help spread the word. But I hope you guys do as well, because it's something that I think is important. And I'm excited that we're able to um, make it happen with this next lecture. Uh, Let's see. Next thing. There's usually three things before I go. Go write a letter. We're going into the dark months of winter. And as COVID has an uptick, I know it can feel hard to connect and come together and know your neighbors and meet people in your community. Um, And if you saw ahead of this show or you go online, we have organized the Dear Neighbor Project and it's a gorge-wide letter exchange. We're already starting to get letters coming in and it's amazing to see what people have to say and share. And if you haven't written a letter in a while, I encourage you to give it a try because it is amazing just how nice it is to slow down and give yourself a chance to reflect and connect with someone else. So go check out the Dear Neighbor Project. That's at mattadamsinstitute.org slash dear hyphen neighbor. And then lastly, if you didn't get a chance to support or you didn't even realize that you could donate um, to help support stories like Seth's and like we'll hear next month with Gladys, it's not too late. (laughs) This is truly truly community supported programs. Um, You can see there on your screen, mountabsinstitute.org slash sponsor is where you can go. And we truly appreciate your support because it lets us seek out people like Gladys and Seth and everyone else that you see on your screen here and have them come share their time and expertise with us. And also now record and archive those stories so that we have something that we can all go to in the future and learn more about this place and more about each other. So thank you so much for joining us. It was great to hear from Seth. We went places I never expected, which is always my favorite. Um, And I hope that I get to see you in one way or another next month when Gladys Rivera joins us. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care.